Hey, Dr. Howie Jacobson here from Plant Yourself. Today I'm trying something I've never tried before, which is to record the intro before the conversation. So in about an hour, I'm going to talk to Dr. Richard Hodge. And I find when I record it afterwards, I'm always like, what do I share? I don't, you know, I want to kind of give you a sense of what's coming up, but I don't want to repeat things later that I've said now. So I just want to tell you why I'm excited about this conversation. So Dr. Richard Hodge is one of the leading systems thinkers about how organizations can work better and how each of us can matter more than we do now. So just going to his homepage, drrichardhodge.com, he says, I'm driven by two beliefs. One, each of us matters more than we think. Two, we can do more than we think in the time we have on this earth. So already I'm inspired. And he talks about this. He says, I take my short life as a gift that comes with a custodial responsibility for the only living planet we know. I'm curiously, I'm constantly curious. How do our decisions drive a sustainable good life, not just for human life, all life? All right, now I'm on board. So his four word mantra is no problem too big. And I have to say, this is not our first conversation. We recorded a conversation a couple of months ago. And afterwards, uh, Richard wrote to me and said, you know, I think that conversation needs to be number four, that we have to lay the groundwork first. So again, as a systems thinker, he's thinking about presenting what we had talked about as something that might come out of the blue and not have enough of a, of a fundamental framework for you to fully appreciate. So this may be a, uh, an ongoing series. I'm ex excited for it to happen. Um, and anyway, without further ado, Dr. Richard Hodge, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Uh, super to be here, Dr. Howie Jacobson, and otherwise I'm known as Richard, and I guess you're Howie, eh? I am Howie, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Splendid. Yes, it takes all, all my willpower not to introduce myself as not a real doctor. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want anyone, you know, coming up to me with an emer needing an emergency, you know, C-section or tracheotomy. So. Oh, no, no, no. No, that's, uh, that's very true. Likewise. But uh, then in some circles, uh, you know, you've done a lot of work to um, earn that uh, recognition. And uh, it's, it's right and proper that uh, it sits in front of your name. Yeah, well, I think we're gonna we're gonna come back to that if I if I understand kind of the, the the flow of our intentions, but so and I have to say that this is actually our second conversation, and after our first one, <laughs> you wrote me an email saying I think that might be conversation number four, and we need to set the stage. So um, since since you are are one of the world's premier systems thinkers, I I tend to. Defer and agree, and and look and and look for the wisdom in what you're saying. So, um, let's set the stage for for this incredibly important work that uh, that you're going to share with us about. That basically, I just want to say, like, what first attracted me to your work was four words on your website, which is no problem too big. Yeah, which just like my nervous system just lit up at the audacity and, and the positivity of that phrase. Yeah, well, and, and you know, that's, um, I think having grown up, I was born in 1955, just as, uh, you know, the, the world was awakening to space and all of those sorts of things. And by the time I was 14, like a lot of others, uh, who were 14 and, and, and other aged in, in 1969, sat there in awe um, as we watched, you know, man step on the moon for the first time ever. And, and that huge accomplishment, you know, was, was never imagined possible by my father or his father, and they were in the room with me watching this happen. <laughs> but when you, you peel back the layers of that project, you know, they started that with something and not really knowing all that they needed to know to make that possible, but yet they got on with it, right? So I think there was the, the very first thing about no problem too big is, is just being able to confront what you know, what you don't know, and what you think. 
so that you can keep those three things in separation and handle those different qualities of information um, in, in the appropriate categories because things will, will shift as you, as you learn more. And that's how come, you know, that, that Apollo program, you know, set up this whole notion of moonshots and that any problem, and there's many big problems in this world, heavens, um, can be looked at as a moonshot. None, mm. No problems too big for you to take action and leave the world better for what you've done. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to, to set it up with that because that's not, how, that's not the way most people I know think about the world. They are looking and seeing problems that are too big everywhere. And the best they can do is focus on one little section of one little problem and feel yeah. un, you know, like under-resourced to solve the rest. Or a lot of people are just like, you know what? I'm just going to live my life, let the world take care of itself, and they kind of check out in, in, in terms of pro-social impulses. And so, you know, ha, let's, let's, let's talk like, meet, you know, meeting people where they are. Like, what do, you, what do you notice or see in the world about how people feel about the world today? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, excuse me just a sec. One of the things that I, I know, well, I notice, what have we seen? Uh, assassination a, a attempt in America, um, desecration still going on in uh, Gaza, uh, in the Congo, and um, uh, and, and other places uh, around the world. Um, politicians saying one thing, doing another, and and I don't have to pull out any particular country. It just constantly is part and parcel, and then a partisan media that um, fails to actually hold people to account so it's you know a lot of people no matter their education can therefore fall into any of those categories that you've just listed and and no matter the you know um, intelligence or the 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 realm of, of uh, thinking and capacity that some people may have it's it's also very easy to be disillusioned with with the world, and and I I take heart from something that I saw on LinkedIn, and it just reminded me from um, Bertrand Russell uh, stating that actually disillusionment is the beginning of wisdom because it's it's either if you're satisfied with the world and you're not concerned about it, then great live your life, enjoy it, right? If there is a measure of disillusionment, then look at that as being the opportunity for us to do something different because clearly what's got us where we are ain't going to get us um, out of the... It's created the problem. We need to think and act differently to um, moving forward on that. And, um, and, and for me... Part of the issue has been our um, education systems, which have been largely built on reductionist philosophies, hmm? which has broken things down. And, and from the Industrial Revolution, uh, uh, just, just broken the curriculum down and, and got us ready for getting into industry into jobs that have been specified, etc. And of course, we know all of that is changing, that education systems can't predict exactly what sort of jobs are going to be there, nor what skills that really are going to be properly required. So part of the, the reframing that each of us that may feel disillusion needs is to challenge our own ways of thinking at present. And um, where I like to start on that is for each of us to anchor on our own sense of value. Hmm? And, um, and because it's, it's when we anchor on uh, value, how we've conceived it and how it's going to drive behavior, um, how we see the world and, and how we want to contribute value in the world and then how value is counted and and when you look at that from a um, 
enterprise perspective, then you can say a lot about you know, what is good behaviour. You can say a lot about what you're going to contribute to the planet, to people, for prosperity. But if at the end of the day your executives are only counting dollars, then all of the rest is mere words and, and then, you know, that, that fall away. So I think for each of us, we can, we can call hypocrisy on that when we see it, but I think it bears us looking in the mirror as to, well, what's our own value set? And what is the difference we want to see and be in the world? And then how is it that I need to shift my own ways of thinking about the world to be appropriate mm. and relevant to the world? So then that, that brings up that uh, uh, issue of um, uh, relevance. And, uh, and so, yeah. I, yeah. Can, can, I, can I just jump in and ask about you yeah, know, like an, an exploration of values? So if you talk to me in the morning, at noon, and at night, you'll talk to three completely different people about values. You know, that there are, there are moments where I feel really expansive, like, you know, I really want the world to heal. I want people to, to grow compassion for themselves and others. I want us to be curious and, 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 and be intrigued and in awe of the world around us. There's, yeah. other, there's other times where my value is like everything's fucked. Let me just, you know, hang on, live a good life, take care of my family, get us out of the US because I think it's, you know, a, a burning dumpster fire and move to Europe where we're in Spain, where it feels a little bit better. And it, yep. and and living in a nice apartment and trying not to look at the pockets of despair all around me. And there's there's other times where, you know, the, my values might be totally around like, let me let me see through the illusion. And this is all just, you know, samsara, samsara and everything is perfect. And I just want to, you know, be embraced by a, a an Eastern philosophy of, of, of no suffering, no attachment whatsoever. Yep. And and all of those are inside me and they can get triggered by by countless little things in, inside of me and outside. Uh, yeah, look, and I and I see no um, uh, problem with that. I think what you've just described perfectly is an example of the complexity of life, the complexity that none of us are, are perfect human beings and there is no perfect solution. But when I think about, uh, you know, my conception of value and how it drives behavior, then I just think of six things, right? And, and those six are honesty. Let's start with the truth. Uh, because if not that, then what? You know, all else is lost. And then transparency, not just the truth, but the whole truth. Then mindfulness, being mindful of, of where we are in our life. And you talk about, uh, you know, whether or not you're mindful about your own self and what you can bring to the world, mindful of your, your role within society, within your family, um, then family within a community, and then what you're seeking to do in the world at a, at a larger scale. And, and that, that mindfulness then triggers those different um, uh, conceptions of, of how you sit um, comfortably or not with your place and as you fulfill different roles uh, in life and it's just being mindful uh, uh, of that so I need mean mindfulness of in that sense so that's the first three then the the last three is that when you're mindful of you know the complexity of the world you realize that we can't do it all on our own so how do we collaborate and here we are having a conversation there's a collaboration uh, for, for starters but it can also scale up to something like you know um, building uh, Terminal 5 at Heathrow Airport which was a massive mega project of, of collaboration but uh, the, and the last two are accountability and not so much as to who, you know, in the old sense of finding someone that you can point the finger at and blame, <laughs> but actually find that you're holding up a mirror to yourself and saying, did I do what I said I'd do? And then, because of the complexity, you know, 
at times we won't be able to. We're imperfect humans and we'll have to go cap in hand and say, oops, that didn't quite work out as expected. Um, and so that leads to the sixth one, which is respect. That if the person you carry that message to, if you don't respect them and they don't respect you, then very rapidly the accountability will form back to a blame culture and then what happens is transparency will disappear and, and, and honesty follows rapidly after that. So I, I look for those sorts of things as being wherever I am, whether I'm thinking about me sitting on a rock um, uh, in a Buddhist tradition or whether me interacting with my family or in the community or on, on grander things, then those six things, you know, I look to how they drive behavior because of the interdependence amongst them. And I, 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 I'm guessing within you that you have some conception of value that in, in the ways in which you behave and work, whether or not with yourself, with your family, and, and with the community and businesses that you work with. So that's, uh, that's the sort of conception of value that uh, uh, I think is something that comes down almost to like the, um, I think, you know, before we started this, you were talking about hardware and software, but, you know, the cognitive processes, what is it that's the core? And it's not so much seated in the DNA, but I can't help but draw something like a, a, a cognitive um, imprint that, that, is applicable no matter the situation. Yeah. So that's, that that's, sort of value, yeah. I think, then you can hold strongly no matter which of those um, domains that Howie is, uh, finds himself throughout the day. Yeah, and I guess what's coming to me is how, how these would be default values in a traditional human culture, say the kind that we lived in for hundreds of thousands of years, and... Yeah, and fall apart at scale, or seem to have fallen apart at scale, at the complexity of nation states, at the complexity yes. um, where, where it's not clear to, you know, if, if, if my world is 119 other people, then I can see how being shitty to, to one person ends up really rebounding on me. Whereas the, the complexity of the systems mean that the feedback loops are either opaque or delayed or may, you know, fizzle out before I ever get bit in the ass by karma. Well, look, that's that's true. You know, I I, I think that um, there's there's stuff that's come as a result of the um, reductionist approach to the way in which I, you know, and that reductionism actually is uh, our institutions are largely built on it from the education systems right through the way in which industry works and the like. But just in between our, our last conversation and this, um, I was fortunate enough to spend some time uh, in the company of some wonderful people, systems engineers at the uh, premier systems engineering conference that uh, moves around the world each year, and this year it was in Dublin. And they had um, a Professor Catherine Cormican um, give one of the keynote addresses and she talked about industry 5.0 and that really is about um, people you know and and automation and um, and really mass personalization on a great level but what she pushed that really stuck with me was the notion of growth being how you stop doing stupid stuff <laughs> right and and then I had a conversation with a um, professor Patrick Godfrey and Patrick in days gone by was a civil engineer he's now an emeritus professor um, and he uh, uh, is, is part of the, the mentoring team of the, the Leadership Institute for Systems Engineering. But it's systems engineering that had its birthplace, going back to where we started this conversation, 
you know, through the Apollo program, that's really where it gained a level of maturity about making big things happen. And um, one of the things that came clear from that conference that was that part, part of the, the stupid things that, that happen is that from our, our reductionist world, there's such a drive for profit that the legal teams and the finance teams get greater say in the way big things get done than they have a right to. Hmm. Right? And you end up doing all sorts of stupid things. Like putting... <laughs> having a, a mega project and, and where I come from um, Professor Patrick Godfrey was that he had um, a, an involvement in the T5 Terminal 5 at Heathrow when that was built uh, at the beginning of this century in that first um, uh, 10 years well in fact it was built in about a 4 to 5 year period but they'd been planning it for a long time but you would expect normal clauses to have you know incentives penalties and 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 all of that they cut all that out that was the stupid stuff because what they wanted were um and uh, was was companies to come in that were the best in their line of business and work together as one and so they set them up as a, a you know everyone worked for the T5 project all roles were were um, of their parent company were done away with. They uh, assumed roles within the T5 project. And all of that stuff uh, around incentives and the like was cut right out. They were um, paid for what it cost them to contribute plus an agreed profit. But um, it removed thousands of disputes that would otherwise happen in these mega projects. So that's that's one example of how you get rid of some of the stupid stuff that's really become part and parcel of the way in which we do things in the world. So it, it, it just because we've always done that doesn't mean that we always should. And there was one example. Of so a before yeah before project. before. Before we get there, I just, I've, I've got fireworks going off in my head and I want to kind of, <laughs> uh, but hold, hold, hold that thought about the project. But if I could, um, like when you said like the definition of growth is how you stop doing stupid stuff, that was so exciting to hear because, you know, my views on growth growing up was growth is good. It's, I think it's still the way our, our, our reductionist systems see it. Absolutely. Right. Growth on a finite planet is obviously, you know, eating it out from the inside. So I'm thinking about, you know, Donella Meadows, the limits of growth. Yeah. And and then like what, what the vision that came to me was kind of growth as, as part of this like Mandelbrot set, like this fractal thing where the right. growth can happen in increased elegance as opposed to increased size, diameter that you can. Right. The, that the Mandelbrot set is an infinite shape, but but it doesn't expand. Right. But so in, I, I will come back to the project because what that enabled them to do in removing that, then everyone wasn't looking for doing, you know, the least amount for the most money. They were actually focused on how can we not only bring best practice, but now make it better as we, you know, manage the interfaces um, between construction and, um, and, and, well, and one of the other things that was absolutely crucial to this was getting governance in uh, early. It's not something that's done uh, later in the procurement phase, but actually brought in uh, uh, very early because um, it, it then a governance model needs to act in the fractal way in that, that you described it so that everyone then has the capacity to remove the stupid stuff that, you know, we might ordinarily do, but we don't do in this particular case. Yeah. Because it, it really comes back to um, the project in that case having a very clear 
value proposition in the agreement. And there was a, a significant amount of, well, I, I listed six things around behavior. They, they had essentially a code of behavior that was a major part of the T5 agreement, right? And, and that really set the governance frame and anchored the project on the way in which they needed people to behave for it to be successful. Right. And I, Isn't you know, yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's such a different view of human nature, right? That, like if I were to tell you, come on my podcast and I'll pay you by the word, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm making an assumption about your, the, your default incentives, that's, right. actually, that's actually quite insulting, yeah. right? That if, if right. you're going to come work and I'm only going to pay you for, you know, I'm, I'm, here are the penalties and here are the rewards. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very reductionist view of, of human nature as well, as opposed to saying we all want to be part of something wonderful. And how can we get remove barriers to that? Yeah. And, and, and of course, what that then does is enable people to move from what's been an agreed value proposition to each of them thinking about what's shifting in the world and what's relevant in all the complexity of what's shifting technologically, socially, etc., that will help deliver that value. So that brings the intersection of both value and relevance uh, to life and enables people not only to look at uh, relevance in the sense of you know, do I realize it and become aware that it's relevant, but also how do we get from the across the knowing and doing gap from um, being aware of some think new being relevant to actually being able to make it real? Because then you've got to look at all of the the interfaces and and everything else. And, and that was what someone else said uh, in um, uh, the conference, and that was um, Paul Nielsen from Carnegie, pardon me, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, that interfaces uh, are often seen, particularly in this reductionist world, as someone else's problem. Well, interfaces are also the greatest, yeah, they may give you the greatest scope for problems, but they're also where you get the greatest opportunity for um, benefit and change. Okay. Can you break that down for me? I don't think I followed the, like, in, in, what you mean by interfaces and, and problems and opportunities. Well, um, in, in, in a reductionist world, you know how, if, you, if I ask someone to describe their organization, what would they do? Typically draw an organization chart, mm, right? right. And, and there would be a whole string of little boxes between finance and um, uh, operations and so on and so forth and, and, and there's space between those two well who is actually managing that space and uh, and yeah so what do organizations typically do well then they run committees and well we know how, how successful they are but no one actually owns the space um, another example of that could be, and we've all been through transport hubs, you know, where bus networks and tram networks come with rail networks and, and um, perhaps at a port or an, at an airport, uh, etc. Now, you can define each of those, but when you look at it as a whole, it's a precinct. Well, who owns the laneways and the passageways between one transport operation and another? No one. Perhaps the council. Um, but is it the council's problem to actually then provide for transport security and the, and, and the risks that may occur through those? Um, but equally, you know, there, there is... So those are the, the interfaces um, that are ripe for problems emerging, like, well, dare I say, in a transport hub that we've seen too much of um, uh, being uh, susceptible to terrorist activity or, or whatever, because there's a high passage of people going through these, going through these interfaces. 
but also there's you know huge opportunity um, to make the most of those as social places where people can convene mm. and have meetings and so on and so forth. And and how then do you realise that as being part of the the social architecture of people um, gathering? And that's yeah. what humans do; they gather. Um, so that, yeah. that's just another way of of looking at it. So when um, I think about uh, you know a transportation hub and I, you know, you put me in mind of like an airport terminal, that gets you know that interface basically gets built by capitalism, right? Like which is why I can buy a three dollar banana, you know, at at a, a a newsstand, you know why why like everything there is now set up for for commerce you know where where the bars are open at 6 a.m. and yet there's still you know there's still metal dividers between the seats so at, th at 2 in the morning after i've missed my connection yeah. i can't lie down that's right but then there's other ways of uh, of of how other uh, societies have looked at that you know and um the singaporeans um at uh, at an airport have actually looked at the interface and gone you know what that's it's a can be a place of high anxiety as people try to rush and meet connections and what have you or a place of stress because hey now what on earth am i going to do with 12 hours while i wait for the, my connecting aircraft from uh, singapore to to adelaide and you go well now they've got big green areas and spaces where you can go and buy a bed for the day, uh, all sorts of things like that, which actually then looks at taking the anxiety out of the interface between one plane and another. Hmm. So it's, right. it's, again, an opportunity to get rid of the stupid stuff. You know, and, and it's not that anxiety is stupid, but um, it's 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 what we don't want in our life, right? And that and that there are ways of um, releasing uh, things that aren't adding value. Yeah. Okay. So if if our listeners are bigwigs and they're in charge of T five or the Singapore Airlines master plan. I can see how they have a lot of hope that like understanding your concepts will help them create a better world. What about the person who is like the cement layer um, at Heathrow or, you know, someone who's middle management who works for a, a car rental company at an airport who are like most of us feel like we are stuck. We are embedded in stupid systems with yeah. with very little power. So, you you know, one of the things you said was like, you matter more than you think. All of us matter more than we think. How, how do how do those of us who aren't at the top bring bring your your insights to life? Well, it's and I don't think you need to be at, at, at the top. And I'm certainly you know, not at the top. And and but then I, I don't think that that notion of being at the top is really helpful. That's part of, you know, it's, 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 it's an archetype from the reductionist world that is, is causing so much, it's, that's at the root of the disillusion and, and uh, that, that many uh, feel within the world. And I remember... I, in fact, I can even remember his name, the fellow that laid the concrete around our home right here. He and, and our driveway had a particular uh, difficult bit, right, where it changed levels and I didn't want to step. You know, it was one thing my wife and I wanted was no steps uh, through here. So how was he going to do it? And he said to me, you know, I was dreaming of this last night as to how I was going to actually <laughs> fix this problem and make this the best possible solution for you. And I got talking to him about that and he said, but I, I regularly do this. I love my work so much that I am trying to find 
the best solutions for the needs of those people and for him that is enough and 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 there in in that he has found his own truth and his own beauty that was driving him to do his best possible work albeit as we might say you know well, he's just a concrete layer uh, uh, uh. I will get Adam Valenti back any time I need concrete laid uh, because he was was one and and his team that worked with him you know all worked with that of making it you know as best possible for uh, serving how we wanted to live and that was that service idea uh, in his mind that made his work worthwhile and, uh, and and you know I was open to suggestions about you know uh, whether or not it was um, exposed aggregate or whatever else and and when I invited him to say well look you work with this more than I um, what would you suggest and and again he came forward and we went with his suggestions um, and simply because of his attachment to giving us something that would last and look good for as long as we provided the care and attention that uh, that his product d d required and um, so I, I, I think it comes down into the individual to see that it's enough for each of us whether or not you know we are um, in, irrespective of our capacity do we work to our own truth? Um, is there a measure of goodness in ourselves that we can bring to others? And is there some aesthetic um, um, or, or emotional beauty uh, around the feelings that we generate as we go about our work? Because that has a ripple effect that we never... Now, this is 15 years ago, and I still remember the guy's name who laid our concrete. Mm. So I think what, what I'm hearing you say is that the idea of the hierarchy, at some sense, is a, a persistent illusion of, of reductionism. And that yes. this, this guy who did this amazing job for you is in, is infusing a spirit into the world through you and through other people in his orbit that that can't be measured that can't be charted on an on, no. on an org chart um no. so it's it's like yeah. orchards that grow together you know and the trees that grow together that that actually help repair and heal one another through the 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 mycorrhizal you know uh, uh, fungi and the like that that are active in the soil but it's that whole network that we just and the complexity and the entanglement that we don't see yeah. and i think that that's what reductionism has done is broken our sense of story and understanding of how indeed um we matter more than we think yeah. so yeah. what one of the groups that replaced it yeah. with a hierarchy that says no they matter yeah. So what, one of the groups that I work with a lot are people who are just below the senior levels of leadership yep. in, or, in organizations. And, and when we get down to the, the crux of whatever problem they're having, um, the emotional the, or the, the, let's say the cognitive glitch that we discover is I need the world to be different so that I can be happy. Right. Or th so that I can be effective, so that I can en enact my vision. And so, you know, a, uh, a concrete layer who works for himself, who has a team, in some senses has a lot more autonomy than people who are embedded in hierarchical organizations and institutions. So how, how, how does your you know, value, relevance, consequence, how, do, how does all that play when you are trying to create something beautiful in your division with your team uh -huh. and you're embedded in a system that's working at, at cross purposes so i i would invite those people to think beyond 
their current job, right? And and one way of doing that um, is if you're given an instruction, you know, and and at the you know below senior level, it could be write this policy, and you go, oh God, okay. If this policy is the answer, what's the problem? Right? And and that opens the conversation to really understanding what the 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 the, the senior manager's executive is trying to fix by way of this policy. And as you have that conversation, then go on to say, well, if that's the problem, why is it a problem? And that may raise the, the appreciation, well, it does, to the context level, which may be the, the remit of the C-suite or the board or both. And now that senior manager can have a conversation about, well, why is it a problem? Well, if that's the case, are we looking at, is that the best definition of the problem? And is writing this policy the best way forward? And because there may be other ways of doing that, and even just having that conversation then exposes that senior manager to the executive and to the C-suite that they're thinking at the enterprise level, that they have the benefit of the enterprise at heart before actually seeking to write a policy. And I'll say this, I remember when I was doing a whole of nation health study in New Zealand, myself and, and uh, my mate Les, Les Haynes, and we were asked, invited to address the question, what's the capacity and capability of the New Zealand health system to respond to serious and unusual emergencies? So a really big question at the whole of nation level. And we started around Wellington, which is the capital of New Zealand, and, and Neither of us, you know, um, I might have doctor in front of my name, but I'm not a medical practitioner. So we had a clinical advisor and he was the senior intensivist. So the head of intensive care at Wellington Hospital. And he gave me and Les a nudge and he said, now, understand this. Bad health policy is more dangerous to my patients than the flesh eating bug. <laughs> wow. Now that's stuck. That's because if you're really not aware, not only of the context of what, of why you're trying to write this policy and the problem that you're trying to solve, but also its impact when it gets out onto the streets, as it were, then you could be setting rules and regulations in place because it is a regulatory function that actually then impairs the function of those things that you most rely on. And in his case, you know, if there was like infectious disease or whatever else, um, the, the, the number of uh, ventilators, the, the, the number of uh, uh, in intensive care nurses that had been trained, etc., etc., were all driven by mistakes uh, or potentially ha him hampered by mistakes in policy setting when someone was looking at training from another uh, angle and putting in a training policy that they hadn't really thought through. So I, I, I think that the invitation, um, and you don't have to be a senior manager to go through that mm. regime, I'm, I'm, right? Yeah. You can be a software engineer, someone straight out of university and because I, I, I ran a business for a global um, uh, engineering firm that had a software development unit. And one of my uh, software engineers, he, he said, right, I've got this job. I said, OK, um, what, what do you know about this job? He said, well, nothing. I've just got to cut code to do this. I said, whoa, stop. I says, I want you now to go and have a conversation with who gave you that job. And I knew who gave him the job, but I wanted him to have the conversation and say, OK, you've asked me to um, develop some software for this. 
if that's the problem, if that's the solution, what's the problem? If that's the problem, why is it a problem? And you immediately take that piece of software into its broader um, context of what is the machine trying to do and then where does that machine fit in a social undertaking and if you, until you understand that then you won't be able to write the best possible piece of software to do the job that you're expected to do so go and have that conversation mm. I, i'm smile i'm smiling yeah i'm smiling because what you're describing is exactly what coaching is right where right. the the client comes to me with their problem and it's a problem because they're seeing it from a certain lens and they're inside the bottle. They can't read the label. And so I just ask questions to broaden the context. And and when I do that, um, like, you know, what's behind the problem? Where's there an opportunity here? All of a sudden their creativity comes flooding in. Yeah. And so can, can you help me understand? So that immediately takes their, their cogn cognitive uh, framework two levels up as well as one level down because the one level down being the end user. Mm. So help me understand what you mean by why is it a problem? Like, do you have, I'm not quite clear. Is it, you know, like what's, what's the consequences of this problem or what caused the no, problem? What's, what's, the first really, what's the context, you know, and do you have uh, an example? So, um, oh, well, um, in in that in the in the junior case of of the software, um, it was to fit within a uh, tracking uh, algorithm for a um, a training uh, device, which was a uh, a simulator for a new brand of aircraft that hadn't yet landed on the ground. So the context was to pre-adapt the users of the actual hardware before the actual hardware arrived. So that for these new, and that was an airborne early warning and control aircraft. So the whole point of that was to realize that you you were trying to um, develop a, or, or contribute to a social outcome of someone who is going to work in and on a brand new aircraft that's not able to even see the aircraft for two years but yet you're going to give them training in that and that's the problem how do we get these people ready and uh, to uh, to shorten the cycle between the aircraft landing and then it being able to be put into operations and that needing a particular you know uh, tracking uh, device uh, a tracking um, subsystem uh, that that it was the interface for the, for the operator. So I'm not sure if that, um, that that's uh, some years back, but uh, the so, context so, yeah. for so, so the so, developer really was, look, you, you know, you've got to uh, really understand what is the training need that this piece is actually satisfying before you can write that piece to um, to your best ability. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there, there are certain things that you might look at um, in isolation and say, oh, that's a problem, and then discover yep. that it's actually not a problem because it's not an obstacle to some to some goal. It's a thing that exists. Right. Like, let's let's say I'm shy and yep. I overcome my shyness when I'm in, in social gatherings. With through a through a series of you know strategic decisions and psyching myself up in the bathroom beforehand, and so we we, we would, I would then come to you and say, well, I'm shy, and you would say, well, why is it a problem? And I go, well, it's actually not. The, the, yes, and right. Where, whereas something else might actually be 
you know, like I, maybe I don't prepare well enough for the for the social gathering, or I don't follow up afterwards, which which are actually which we wouldn't we wouldn't even be able to define what's the problem until you ask me why are you even going. Right. right. And 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 that is part and parcel of it. What do you even need to um, attend this social gathering? What is the need that's driving you to see this social gathering as a requirement for you? In which case, are, are you? It, go back to the earlier stuff. Is this some of the stupid stuff you can take out of your life? Mm. Now and 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 then you go. But it's not about you know. Well, just take the pain bits uh, away. You know, n n no pain, no gain. But um, but equally, be selective about the battle and the pain that you put yourself through and the, and the growth that you're going to gain through that as to how that sits with your own value proposition for um, how you, you know, conceive value in your own behavior, how you contribute value socially, and how indeed then you'll count value through the growth that would occur um, from you going and, you know, stretching uh, uh, your your shyness into actually an, an engagement um, that enables you, you know, not necessarily to like it all the more, but to being able to being more resilient to those things, knowing that you're only putting yourselves in that situation when you know it really matters. Mm. Uh -huh. So I'm not, uh, you know, burning fuel unnecessarily. There we are. Mm. And and then that becomes far far more, you know, tolerable. Mm. So I'm I'm feeling a hankering for a Venn diagram. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I know we 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 talked about um, you know the, the the value relevance and consequences to a little bit, but I would love for you to elucidate that model for me, and then hopefully for for our audience well, as well. Let me bring bring this up and see if uh, uh, we can uh, indeed. So if we're we're thinking, we've talked a bit about uh, value. Um, we, we, we've talked a bit of, about um, relevance and, and, and the fourth uh, uh, piece, sorry, the third piece uh, here um, is, is consequences um, because what we're looking at is being anchored on value, knowing what is relevant in uh, what you think about and what you act but being aware of the consequences of your actions so that you're actually contributing what you're seeking to achieve. Is this showing right, or do I need to... Yep, uh, looks great uh, to me. It's showing fine. It's yep. just on my screen. It's, uh, it's got it in reverse. No, um, you... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the whole aim around that consequences piece is that, you know, for me, it, it really, and it's something I took from that senior intensivist in um, Wellington, New Zealand, was that what if everything we were doing seeks first to do no harm? Because, you know, every medico pretty much signs up to that and behaves in that manner. And what if every single one of us also sought to do that? And um, I, I'm pleased to hear from the Systems Engineering Conference that in fact there is a group of people in the world currently writing an international standard on seeking first to do no harm where big things are involved. But when we um, understand our value and it's relevance, then that actually gives us and imparts the will that we need to get on and make the changes, whether or not it's the simple, well, the simple, the, the um, very personal uh, thing of going into a room where you, you may feel shy and whatever, but dealing with that discomfort and working through it all the way through to going, well, yes, 
this is a really big problem and there's a whole lot we don't know but we really do need to get a move on uh, with it and get started um, and and that drives the will uh, and the when we think about then not only being aware of what's relevant but enacting it with a view to seeking first to do no harm then what we're seeking to improve is as what Adam Smith might have called the wealth of nations but I don't want to invoke Adam Smith necessarily even though I just did but when we're thinking about wealth too often uh, today our um, economic thoughts and economic paradigms have been driven to growth and you talked about this uh, earlier Howie but what about all of the Commonwealth you know those those uh, uh, interfaces those la those lands those uses of the environment um, where we've been extractive but actually just ended up destroying um, the environment that was used by other peoples um, uh, etc so there's a positive and a negative side of that and with wealth we need to think very carefully about the currencies uh, that that we're currently using um, and uh, 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 in, indeed um, also thinking you know about the question of interfaces that we talked about uh, earlier because if we've got a very narrow view of our own wealth and only trying to optimize the outcome for ourselves, then very frequently we sub-optimize the outcome for the whole. And, and that's something then that um, we, we need to be very mindful of um, as we uh, proceed around that. So seeking first to do no harm then brings us round to a question here of, and I shall write it here, of worthiness. And worthiness is a uh, concept. Oh. Worthiness is, a, is that concept of of, of actually meeting the value proposition that we set out to do in the first place that that we we're, we're we're thinking about whatever we're seeking to do and its impact on the whole of life so that we can not only move from you know user centered design human centered design but actually to life centered design so that and I'm not just talking about human life but all life and and if in our value proposition we've talked about um, contributing to you know for people planet and prosperity then our worthiness needs to be measured against all those three so it really is a way of closing the loop or in a business sense enabling people to realize that what actions they take matter more than they think and for them to garner an enterprise view hmm. because it's very easy for one person to actually destroy the, re the goodwill and reputation of an enterprise right hmm. well that's the rogue, the rogue banker the well it's also it's also that you have these you know these systems and within Within certain cultures, like the one that I grew up in, and I think the one you grew up in, there's there's vulnerabilities like the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma, right. right? Where you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have that in an indigenous population that that ha that has mastered interfaces with nature, with each other, with others. But our our systems, you know, once once we get reductionist. There, it's like Jenga towers. It's very easy to pull out the wrong Absolutely. block, and it all comes down. That's a very good analogy. So That's how do a very good analogy? And, so, and, so what and, do we do? <laughs> well, 
then I, I, I think it's really how we, um, having anchored on value, how then do we explore relevance? And I think that there's another whole hour around that because I, I could talk about how that falls into four groups of questions and, the, and, and they're typically questions that help you better learn about the why, um, that give meaning to what we're doing. They're questions that enable you to explore the how and how in the sense of how we're connected to the whole and, and the indigenous view there is, is really quite illustrative of the differentiation between a Western view that I was brought up with and an indigenous view, um, which would see them talk about their connection not only uh, to themselves and to their land, but through the land, to the water, the air, their ancestors, their song lines, the stories, uh, uh, and the air they breathe, and, and their, how they think generationally about the change in the culture that, uh, that they're all connected to. That's so wholesome. But there's a group of questions there uh, around how is everything connected. The third group around of questions are around the what. So, so really that then helps us to reflect on the nature of the change that we would want to impart. But ideally working with those who deeply understand the connection so that you co-create that and then implement it through if style questions that if we did X, would that shift to Y and does that add to the value and the meaning that we were seeking in the first place? And, and so there's a, there's a whole process um, that enables us to go in a um, infinity loop which is life, right? A, 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 a life of infinite learning through those four groups of questions. Hmm. I, I, I think we have accomplished what we set out to accomplish in this uh, introductory session. How do you feel? I, 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 I think we have, because I, I, I think being able then to um, get to a point where you go, yes, OK, yeah, we, we have anchored on value. And yeah, look, I get the, the cognitive reframe that, that relevance is um, as much about understanding the software in our, in our own head and how that has to constantly change to fit with the changing world, mm. bearing in mind um, whatever action we take will have and or don't take will have consequences that will impact on the value that we're seeking to achieve. So, so how do we actually constantly work through that? Just like in the Moonshot program, they always knew why. And even the old apocryphal janitor story with JFK, you know, saying, well, um, uh, when, when uh, asked, uh, the janitor says, well, I'm, I'm here to help put a man on the moon. Now, whether or not that story actually ha happened is, is beside the point. Um, it's, it's actually that people connect with the overall purpose that gives their meaning, their job meaning. Cool. So um, let's let's put a pin in it for there. I think next time we're we're going to talk about the dragonfly, <coughs> which we can we can there see. There they are. There, the wings of the dragonfly, indeed. So we'll uh, we'll leave that as a, a little cliffhanger for folks. There's pl plenty to uh, to digest and follow up here. For people who want to learn more about you and your work, where do they go? Um, come to my web website. Uh, Dr. Richard Hodge, Dr. Richard Hodge dot com, and um, and from there you can you can see some of the things that I've written, uh, some of the things uh, the way in which I engage uh, with people in the world, and also just uh, simply also reach out if you would like to uh, uh, explore any aspect of this conversation with me. 
Well, thank, thank you for that uh, kind invitation. It's a, uh, a font of wisdom. You have some amazing videos in which you, uh, you take us through models, and I'm hoping we'll, uh, we'll continue to explore those in our conversations. It, has, it is so much fun to talk to you because, because of the way you can open my mind to possibility without contradicting anything I already believe or know. You just, but you expand the frame and then naturally my mind gets, you know, bigger and more energized. So I really appreciate that energy. Yeah. It, it's, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> because it does it for me too, right? It, and it's, it's something that uh, uh, is, is shared in those conversations. And that must have been what it was like to work on that T5 project, right? Mm. Yeah, you, you almost made me want to go to Heathrow, which is I've never, <laughs> is never anything I've ever thought before. <laughs> well, to go to T5, you'd have to fly British Airways, so maybe think again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, a, maybe a field trip from, from uh, Ryanair. There you go. <laughs> All right, Richard, thank you All so right. much. I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Howie. Cheers now. Uh, Bye. And that's a wrap. Find the show notes for today's episode at plantyourself.com slash 591. So what's been going on? I've been taking the week off after the tournament uh, now two weekends ago in Lerma. La this past weekend, I did not go to Ultimate. I just relaxed. I stayed in bed as much as possible. And the more I rested and slept and relaxed, the more my body wanted. So this morning was the first time I'd been active in a while. Went down to the beach to do a workout with Jay, my trainer. We added a new thing. Uh, we added strengthening shoulders with bands, sort of lifting up uh, to the front and then laterally. Um, so I'm hoping this is going to help my, my mid and upper back in the same way that all those squats and walking lunges have really improved my knees. Um, it's getting hot here. It's... Um, been a cool June and July for this part of the world, but it's supposed to become a scorcher now for the next five or six weeks. So bracing for that. Workouts have been moving from 9.30 to 8.30 to 8 to this morning, 7.30. Next week, we're going for 6.30. And hopefully I can get it in before the heat becomes unbearable. Also, apparently they are dredging more sand onto the beach where I worked out last summer, but the beach has pretty much disappeared due to a storm uh, in the fall. And now they're trying to uh, rebuild it so they can uh, get pack more tourists, get the restaurant back up, porta potties, and restore things to to the way they were when we first arrived. So that's about it. Uh, have a as always <laughs> a good week and be well, my friends.